first I'm going to plunge deeper into um, some of the thinking that impacts, that now we're getting into stuff that really impacts management, right? And so if you could take all the talk about new ways and put it in a big pot and boil it down until there was only one word left, the word that would be left would be trust. The new ways of working are about trust, restoring trust, restoring trust between IT and the rest of the organization, but it's restoring trust between the organization and its customers, restoring trust between staff and management is a huge one because it's lost in many organizations. Staff don't trust the managers. So restoration of trust is, is, is at the heart of achieving what we're going to do. And, and so that's quite profound for managers because a lot of managers start from a position of distrust. Of their staff and so this is one of the things I say to really challenge managers I say to them do you want your staff to trust you yeah I, of course I do well staff won't trust you until you trust them you want a trust relationship you go first and that's quite challenging to a lot of people the same with do you trust your suppliers mm, not sure do you want them to trust you? Yes. Well, you trust them. You can't expect someone to trust you when you are exhibiting non-trust behavior. And obviously that's a, a growth thing, right? But you, you go first, you make the first move, you start trusting and then they'll start trusting and you can trust more and they can trust more and you work your way forward. You go first. And we have some concepts in these new ways of working, don't we, that really challenge um, our ideas of trust and really challenge our ideas of, yeah, of trust and, and of how we should do things. So Agile is founded on this principle of anarchy, capital A anarchy, right? On a, an organizational system that has no leaders and no defined roles, that is an Agile team. And you know to a lot of managers that's a deeply challenging concept that's not going to work what well, does in fact it does it works better um organizational trust so at the extreme our aspiration should be that we have self-certifying teams you're all it people is this change good to go into production we as a team, we stand by this change. It is ready to go into production. It is sufficiently tested. It is of a high enough quality. We understand the implications to all, all other systems. We say this is good to go. And the rest of the organization goes, okay. Why not? Who is more qualified to understand the implications for change than the person who built it? And who is second most qualified to understand the implications of those changes? The person sitting next to the person who built it. So if the team says it's good to go, it's good to go. The idea that a third party, like a change manager, or a group of people sitting in a cab, having their souls sucked out, listening to 300 changes in a morning, the idea that those people are better qualified to determine the risk of a change than the person who built the risk is frankly patronizing. If you treat people like children, you will get childish behavior. If you treat them like adults, you will get adult behavior. Okay, you certify it. You say it's good to go. Great. You're accountable if it doesn't. You will answer for it. This, we don't have time to debate these now, but this is the deeply challenging thinking underneath the new ways of working. And this is not a course about new ways of working, so we're not going to go into this. But these are the things that it boils up that are deeply challenging to managers in terms of ways of managing. The idea of diversity. So we understand now in new ways of thinking that diversity is fundamental to creativity and to problem solving and to innovation. And so if you've got a room full of old white males, you're going to get one set of ideas. If you've got a room full of crazy young hipster kids, you're going to get a completely different set of ideas. If you've got diversity, those ideas will interplay and, 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 and interact with each other and create 
better ideas. I was reading this morning that, you know, the story about Viagra, that when Viagra was um, being tested for heart disease, they discovered this interesting other side effect of it that it had on men. And um, so the group that got together to decide what to do with Viagra, they had also discovered that Viagra relieves period plaque pain and helps menstrual cadence. And uh, the, the panel, I think within the, the pharma company, was entirely constituted by older men. And when they decided, what are we going to research with Viagra? They said, we'll go for the dick thing, right? And because uh, period pain and cramps is not a public health issue. But apparently men's ability to get an erection is. And an entirely male group decided that, right? So diversity is, 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 is a huge contributor to our effectiveness. And so diversity of teams, diversity of people in the room for any sort of discussion or workshop, diversity of views and so I always say to people when you look at the group when you when you walk into the room for a workshop I've assembled um, you should go oh I want people to go oh this is a strange bunch of people to have together for this conversation uh, so I, the analogy I use is every group should look like a bar scene from Star Wars right? there should be some highly unpredictable people in the mix the more ordinary and predictable the group of people you have assembled, the less creative and innovative they're going to be. This is, and, and, and what do conventional managers do? They look for people like themselves. They look for people who think like they do. They look for friends. Another deep thing that comes out of new ways of working that's challenging to managers is the concept of slack. And here's yet another fabulous book for you to read is Tom DeMarco's Slack. Is anybody old enough to remember when Tom DeMarco used to write computer programming books? I'm real old. When I went to university, DeMarco was one of the authors of our textbooks for computer science. And, and so in 2000, he was already getting a bit long in the tooth. And he wrote this extraordinary book. So this came out the same year or the year before Agile. And it's a wonderful book. It's really good reading and it's great to give to managers because it's all about, at its heart, it's all about utilization is not equal to throughput. So conventional management has this mindset of optimum equals every resource, including our people at 100% utilization. Conventional management says, you keep working towards 100% utilization for optimal efficiency. And that's not true in a factory with the machinery, and it's not true in knowledge work with the humans. It's not true anywhere. You do not get maximum throughput at maximum utilization. So if this is your throughput through your system, and your quality, by the way, through your system, and this is your utilization across the bottom, this is what the curve looks like. When you get to 100% utilization, nothing is getting done. Cherry was in a factory and um, she was talking to people and she said, what are, this, what are these old screwdrivers here? And they said, oh, those screwdrivers are for sharpening. So if we're sitting around talking and we see a manager coming, we grab the screwdrivers and we're all sharpening them. So they're there just to have something to do to look busy when a manager comes by. Because these managers are in this mindset of why aren't those people doing anything? I used to say years ago, long before I understood half of this, that, that firemen play cards. Right? Nobody complains because the firemen aren't busy. There is mathematical queuing theory that you can dig out that says that maximum utilization comes, and there are variables to this, but the rule of thumb, my rule of thumb is about 80%. So if people, are, well, so if, you, if your machinery is at 100% utilization, let's start with machines, then if there is the slightest variation in the performance of one of your machines, 
what happens to the whole chain of flow? Right, the moment one machine glitches and hiccups and someone has to come in and fix it, there's this cascading, it's like driving on the motorway bumper to bumper at 110 kilometers an hour. Right, the moment there's the slightest perturbation to that, all hell breaks loose. If at 80%, there is room for people to, to absorb the disturbances that come in the system. If it's humans, then what happens when we run humans at 100%? Actually, we don't run humans at 100%. We run them at 120% because we expect them to work 50 and 60 hour weeks. And the law says they work 40 hour weeks. So we run our humans at 120%. What happens when you run a server at 120% CPU? Well, you can't. Unfortunately, you can with humans. But what happens when you run a server at 100% CPU? It gets hot. So humans need to rest. You do not get optimum productivity at 100% utilization of humans. You get knackered humans. So there's two sides to this. There's the humane side of not thrashing our people. And there is the mathematical lean theory side that of throughput of flow. And on both counts, if you don't have slack in your systems, you've got suboptimal systems. Big challenge to the conventional ways of thinking. So don't run, don't do it to your people. If you're close, you're out of no room for error. Um, and another uh, aspect of Slack as well is um, agile backlogs. So when we build backlogs of work, we're thrashed to work at 100% on new. Feature, 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 feature. And going back to yesterday, product, not project. If you're on a project team, all the project manager cares about is new features. And so if the um, team start putting work on the backlog to refactor things, to improve quality, to go back and rework that temporary thing, what happens to that work on the backlog? It gets deprioritized. It never sees the light of day. It, with a, and, if, and if they start thinking about improvement, we could work better if we automated this specific task and they put that on the backlog, what happens to it? There's no interest in that in a project mindset. In a product team, you put everything on the backlog and you have this rule, 80-20. We only do 80% new. 20% of our work in any cadence should be uh, housekeeping, maintenance, rework, improvement to how we work anything other than new features. It's more important to improve work than to do work. If you're not making time for improvement, it will never happen. If you're 100% new features, you're screwed. And even in a project environment, we should try and enforce this rule. Um, Gene Kim calls it the 20% tax. Right, all projects should pay a 20% tax to allow maintenance and refactoring and defect fixing and all these kind of things. So slack is another big challenge to, to management. Limiting whip is another huge challenge to management. You know, just one more thing. So um, Troy de Moulin, who's one of the big thinkers at Pink Elephant, um, he when way, way back when Kanbans were a new thing, he said to his staff, I want you all to have a personal Kanban so that you get to know Kanban in your office, right? And just weeks later, he rings one of his staff and he says, look, look, there's just one more thing I urgently need you to do. And she says, Troy, could you just step down to my office for a minute? And he goes down there and she points to a Kanban and she says, can you tell me which one of these things in my currently working on column you'd like me to put back in the to-do so that I can do this thing you're phoning me about? And he was like, she can ban me. <laughs> this management are like, yeah, 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 I know you're busy, but I'm important. There's just one more thing I need you to do. And because I'm the manager, I get to poke it in. But we know, hopefully, that by limiting work and progress, we get far more done. This is a new ways of working thing that we're not going to cover here, but it's a challenge to management. Also, the myth of multitasking. 
So I got in a big fight on a panel up on a stage once with someone from one of the big four when I said that people on the service desk, I had a guy on second warning because he was always on Bebo chat with his girlfriend when he was on the phone to a client. And this guy in his fancy suit said, oh, you don't understand the new generation. They can multitask like that. You're just being old and old party. And we had a huge fight. I was like, no, nobody, he, he's not giving his full focus to the client. He's not doing his best at his work by text chatting to the girlfriend while he's actually talking to the client. Mm. Got into a huge fight. Well, the research is out since then. There's really strong research that says humans do not multitask. We context switch really fast, but we context switch to make it the illusion of multitasking. And we're always suboptimal. Here's another challenge for management. This is a great one. So Lean has this language of you either do value work or you do necessary non-value work or you do unnecessary non-value work. Okay, guess what happens to unnecessary non-value work? It's gone. Necessary non-value work we maintain, but we minimize it. It's the stuff we have to do in order to make sure that the value work happens. But what's the most important of those? It's the value work. And who's doing the value work? Or put another way, do managers do value work? Only if they're multitasking as also being a member of the team as well as a manager. So we did a big uh, value stream map one time, a very important tool, value stream mapping. Um, we did a big value stream map one time for an internet development team. And all this work filled up the whiteboard and the manager said, where am I on that? And I drew a tiny little stick figure in the bottom left corner of the whiteboard. And I said, Karen, you're here. Managers don't do value work. And in general, I mean, French sweeping generalizations, right? And so therefore, the fundamental of lean is if you're doing non-value work, get the heck out of the way of the people who are doing the value work. So when you examine everything that managers do and you ask the question, is this facilitating and accelerating the flow of value to the customer or is it impeding and loading the flow of value to the customer? It's a really good question. So one of the things is challenge the level of ceremony. Why do we have to do this stupid dance just to get a piece of work from here to here? And I don't have time to go into that. But. And the other one is less theater. So do you know what I mean by theater? So if I get up on a stage and I dress like a fisherman and I pretend to be fishing, you know I'm not fishing and I know I'm not fishing, but we all agree to pretend I'm fishing for the illusion. And business is full of theater. We have security theater and risk theater and project management theater. Where we're all doing the stupid dance just to tell managers, yes, we're doing the managing the risk or yes, we're doing the progress reports. But it's just a silly little dance to keep management happy. It has no productive value whatsoever. This is a deeming joke, right? So deeming worked in American automotive industry and then went to work with the Japanese and, and the Toyota. And he was very uh, condemning of American thinking and, and around quality, right? And so he, this was his joke. He used to say, let's make toast the American way. You burn, I'll scrape. So one of the big challenges to management is this idea that just get the work done, just get the cars built, just get them down the production line and we'll fix them later. And they used to have teams at the end of the production lines just whose full-time function was to fix the cars on the production line. And the Toyota and Deeming said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to burn the toast in the first place, the quality in. So part of that, one of the new ways of working is shift left, which means um, move the 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 quality management, the controls, the accountability left in the flow of work. You've got this big arrow of flow and um, then move it left. So do it earlier. Quality should be built into, baked into the work, not a thing at the end. Our control should happen as early as possible. So we know we're not going to pass control as early and easily as possible. The accountability should happen back where the work is done, not to some poor sod further down the pipe who has this green slime arriving that they're then held accountable for.
So shift left is this huge fundamental in thinking um, in, in, in flow. So people say we have no QA function. And they don't mean we have no QA function. What they mean is there's not someone sitting at the end of the production line checking the quality and rejecting burnt toast. The quality team is working in the work to lift the quality to the point where we know we don't need to check at the end. We devote our energy to lifting the quality and knowing what the quality is in the work. So we don't need this huge step at the end to be reviewing quality. I'll play a video for you. If you haven't seen this, this is a beauty. That we lived long enough to see that just, I say, so it gives me shivers as an engineering geek, that we can land the remains of a rocket back on a ship in the middle of the ocean is just extraordinary. The probability that they could have done that the first time they tried is what? So we have to completely rethink how we understand failure when we live in a constantly changing world. Our work is almost never simple. It's almost never defined and repeatable anymore. We're almost never doing what we did before. We're almost always doing something new. Not always quite that new, but to some extent, we're always doing something new every time we do something. Because we're in this constantly changing world. Failure is not a negative, and we completely have to flip our thinking about failure. We have to understand that failure is a fundamental to, in fact, not only is it a fundamental, failure is the path to getting work done. Success is found under a pile of failure. Failure is the path to success. To get to easy, you have to go through hard. There's all these different sayings, right? So we will fail. Failure, here's another one for you. Failure is normal. Failure is the normal state of work. Failure is the normal state of work. There's another one. So therefore, let's redefine failure. We should fail fast, fail early, fail small, fail often. Another great saying is fail well. That comes from Mark Schwartz, who's a DevOps writer. Fail fast, fail early, fail small, fail often. Don't fail by taking out a government department for two weeks. Fail by having something not work in the test environment. Right. having something not work in one office of 20 people. So this relates to experimentation, right? We should experiment with the minimum. What's the minimum experiment we can do to validate what, what we're doing? I love the term minimum blast radius. What can we do that has the minimum blast radius to validate our hypothesis? Right, there are three types of failure. There's preventable failure in simple work, in repeatable work. There's unavoidable failure in complex systems and there's intelligent failure when we're really pushing the edge. Now, which one of these is unacceptable? It's a trick question. None of them are unacceptable. So if you read Sidney Decker, that book about field guide to human error, human error happens. People get distracted. People get tired. Human error happens all the time. So if we punish human error, what happens to human error? What happens to the error? What happens to the failure? It goes underground, it gets hidden. We never get to hear about it. Now, Dick is coming from a safety point of view. He wants to improve safety. So he wants people to tell him about human failure so that they can design for it. If someone does something stupid in your system, you should thank them. You should thank them for exposing the weakness in your system that allows people to do stupid things. And you should better design your system to prevent the human error. But if you don't thank people for telling you about their human error, you're never going to hear about it. If you punish people for their human error, you will never hear about it. Therefore, you will not learn from it. So failure that is welcomed is an asset. It contains gold. It contains learnings that we can improve. Failure that is punished is a cost. And so the reason conventional managers think failure is a cost is because conventional managers punish failure. The moment you reward failure, 
failure becomes the path to success. It becomes gold. It becomes an asset of the organization because it contains information. But if you can't harvest that information, it's now a cost. Another thing about punishing failure is it's usually not the person's fault. Most people are victims of a system that prevents them from succeeding. The first thing I always go and look at is what did the system do to make them fail? And nine times out of 10, the system did something that prevented them from succeeding. So don't fix the person, fix the system. You should be able to run a system with ordinary people. If you need excellent people, if you need heroes, if you need superstars to make your system work, it's a bad system. A good system works with ordinary people. A good system deals with the fact that people make mistakes. A good system deals with the fact that people, you know, are just average employees. Stop trying to fix the people, fix the system. And another aspect of this is unreasonable systems make unreasonable people. When people say to me, oh, he's an asshole. I'm like, really? What's he like down at the pub? Oh, down at the pub, he's really nice, but at work, he's an asshole. Ah. So maybe ask yourself, what's the system doing to that person? Don't blame the people, blame the system as your first default position. One time in 10, it actually is the person. And even then, reward them for failure and harvest the value of what, what we can learn. I mentioned the J-curve yesterday. Um, this again is something that managers have to get their heads around, right? That we're tootling along, capability slipping, so we do some sort of intervention to try and change the way we're working because we're all going to get better when we do. And management have this expectation that suddenly everything's going to get better. And we, or many of you know, that that's not what happens. We get a J-curve. Anytime you change the way we work, we go backwards first before we go forward. We go backwards because uh, it takes practice with new ways. So we're suboptimal. But there's a more fundamental thing at work, going back to what I've been saying. When we change the new ways of working, we don't know what's going to work. We will get it wrong with the new way of working. We will get it wrong with designing the new way of working. And only when we try, only when we do, will we realize the bits that we got wrong and we'll fix them. That's so fundamental to get managers to understand. We will get it wrong. We cannot design a perfect optimal new ways of working. Once we try it, we will discover the bits we missed. We'll discover the bits that aren't exactly right. So one is just people practicing and getting into it, but the other is just iterating our way towards a better new way of working. And of course, what happens is management see the curve going down and they freak and they go, go back, everybody, go back, everybody. And we all run backwards again. And that just makes an even bigger mess. 2 p.m. on a Sunday. No, we're not going live. Unwind it all again. So how do we fix the J-curve? Many small iterations instead of one big one. This is a fundamental of our job. This is what I've been saying, many small experiments, minimum blast radius, lots of small J's instead of a big bang project. Okay, so it is, here you are, exactly halfway through our time. How about halfway through day three, we actually start talking about new ways of managing. That'd be nice. So one of the hardest things to get across, again, to conventional conservative managers is this is not hypothetical. We're not talking about some crazy untested idea. We're not even talking about some idea that only works in one or two unicorn weird and wonderful organizations, right? We're talking about stuff that is being tried and being proven all over the world in thousands and thousands of organizations. The key thing is when people say, show me proof, they mean go and show me an organization that is already completely teal, completely um, uh, ag agile, completely, you know, magic s automated systems, da 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 da. And no. Because stop measuring yourself against perfect. Stop going to look for perfect, for example, for how this works. 
understand that everybody's doing this imperfectly. Everybody's doing it spottily, not spotifyly, spottily across the organization, in pockets, you know, everybody's doing it and some of it's failing. That's not the point. In general, they will all say, we can see the value in this, we can see how it's improving things. So this is a picture I like to show to organizations when I'm first talking to them. And I say, okay, a piece of work comes in, ask my manager, yes, and then I pass on the next person to do their bit. They ask their manager, who says, yes, and he, I ask his boss first, and then across, and then this one says, have you heard about this? Yeah, I did hear about it, keep going, good. And then this one does ask their boss, and their boss asks their boss, and their boss asks their boss's boss, says, did you hear about this? Yes, I did, yeah, they did hear about it, All right, keep going. And they go across and then they go back and then he goes back. Did you? Yeah, I did. I did. Keep going. And then suddenly this one says, I better check with Fred that when it came in. Yeah, did. that was all right. Good. Okay. Can we go with this? Has everybody heard about this? Right. Oh, all right. We can do the, we can send, ship the work. This is the normal conventional way of management participating in a piece of work. And with our big, you know, today I am wearing clothes from our big client in Vietnam, Sherry, Sherry took 27 approvals out of one process. A, a different picture is one where we only need to ask the bosses who need to know. And then everybody just does the work and do the responsible checks to make sure that the affected managers know at the appropriate time in the flow. And when you say to a lot of the other managers in the previous picture, do you know why you're approving this piece of work? So many of them, so a th I reckon about a third of them have no idea why they're even approving, right? And, and, and another third of them don't particularly want to be approving, even though they know why they're there and don't particularly see it as necessary. It's really easy to rip two thirds of the approvals out of a lot of old, heavy, conventional legacy processes. It's theatre. Going back to my comment about theatre, it's just theatre. It's just a funny little dance. No, this is the necessary non-value work where we're doing protection of the organization. We're doing risk control, that kind of thing. This is the necessary non-value work. Everything on the previous thing was unnecessary non-value work. And Rob, yeah, Rob can I say something about this? Yeah, yeah. Um, so from my own experience, I think uh, I've, I've, with, I've seen two things that if you st if you want to stop to, uh, being part of this theater uh, first of all I think it can be very isolating that uh, one manager decides not to take part in this because all the others still expect to do it um, and also I think you have to make sure that it's uh, that the team feels safe that you don't want to do this anymore that they understand why you do this because otherwise they will um, well, not understanding why you no longer want to approve their work. That's how they've been used to work for a very long time. And it's like a, almost a safety net, uh, ask covering almost sometimes. So also, those also are two things insult. that I've seen. You, you're saying, I don't care yeah. about what you're doing anymore. Yes. Yeah. Good point. And, and all of these things are evolutionary. We say don't big bang, right? So these are the aspirations and, and we should work our way towards them because as you say there are consequences and side effects and knock-on effects many of which are unpredictable we don't know until we do how the beast is going to respond especially humans so we increment our way carefully through experiment towards these new ways because as you say the moment one manager says oh i don't want to be in that cycle we then have to see what all the consequences of that are and perhaps mitigate them or fix them. Where is the value stream in a hierarchical map of management? Which bits of management are doing the value? Well, they're not. The management are managing the value stream. The people who do the value, who create value, the people who move value, are the people doing the work. That's the value stream. And so this came to me one time when I was in a meeting room and somebody drew you know the value stream and then they started drawing management as this big pyramid sitting on top of it like this and i went up and i rubbed it out and i said no 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 management exists underneath the value stream you should draw management as a foundation holding a tree holding up the value stream not this infrastructure sitting on top as a load and a burden on the value stream 
And so flip the thinking, flip the hierarchy. But that leads us, of course, to the concept of servant leader, which we'll talk about in a minute. Right? You're there to serve the value, not the other way around. And so there's all these new models out there, and, and I'm not going to talk about them, but you know, there's things like sociocracy and holocracy and, um, and, and um, Camelot, and there's all these models for new ways of working that are, uh, are non-hierarchical, that are entirely non-hierarchical. There are ways for people to collaborate. Our game, The Message, is the, the one we mentioned the other day. The message is there to demonstrate that you don't need managers. At the end of the day, we say, okay, in all of that game that you played, where were the managers? There aren't any. And yet you get to build this big message on the wall entirely collaboratively. There's these collaborative models that, that, that allow us to work without um, managers. And, and so it's a great example for us of a culture that allows fluidity within a framework, a loose, loose framework of rules. Anyway, um, so that sort of thing is really challenging to management. What do you mean you're not going to follow the rules? Oh, we're following the rules. You know, they provide a guideline, a framework within which we don't actually kill each other. But, you know, only the looseness of affiliation with those rules. Um, yeah. Um, another one that challenges management is let go of the wheel. You know, stop trying to drive. So this is a great one, uh, especially when they rebadge project managers as scrum masters. Then, you know, scrum master is very much a servant function and project managers just can't stop going, no, no, wait, get out of the way. You're doing it wrong. Let me drive, you know. And, and so having the trust in people to drive, and even when you go, oh, don't do that, that's going to hurt. No, you shouldn't. Oh, I told you, you shouldn't have done that. Right? You've got to let people learn. And that means letting them um, run the car into the fence and have to go back and help the farmer fix it again, not think hypothetically. Um, you know, the, the teenagers are going to crash cars, right? And, and in the same way, your teams will never learn unless you actually let them run into the fence occasionally. So a fascinating thing, if you've read um, Google's Site Reliability, SRE, uh, which one of the essays in there is about how they could run Google at, um, I can't remember the numbers now, I think they could run Google at seven nines availability, which means it's down for a minute a year or whatever, but teams are allowed to run at five nines availability. In other words, they're allowed to have a couple of hours outage every year and still be within their SLA. The SLA is lowered below what the organization is capable of so that they don't tight, hold the team so tight that they can't experiment and innovate at all. They're allowed to actually go bang in production a certain amount every year just because they're trying stuff and they're moving forwards. Another picture that I draw is to say, you've got the stack of how much guidance you could and control you could give to people in doing their work from at the highest level, just vision and strategy, all the way down to deeper and deeper documentation of what they need to do. And how much of that do we provide as managers to the team rather than them coming up with themselves? How much of it do we direct to the team? Well, if it's an immature team, you might direct pretty much all of them to them and say, this is what I need you to do. But as a team grows in, in their capability of new ways of working, we should give less and less of this to the team. We just leave them to get on with the job. The very best workers, you just say to them, look, this is the vision, this is the goals, here's the policy, basic rules about what you can and can't approve and do and your spending limits and stuff. Go for it. And the company that I worked for years ago, we've actually had a bad rep in the public eye, but internally they were fantastic. They literally, this is what they did. You know, I rang my dad up and I said, I'll just be made a manager. What do I do? And he says, what's your budget? I said, I don't have one. Or what's your job description? I don't have one. You know, what, what's, what's, what's your program plan? You know, program management plan. What are we working with? I don't have one. 
oh, I can't help you, click, right? Because in his conventional world, I had none of the tools that a manager should have. They just said to me, there's your team, there's your goal, go and do it, right? I never, no one ever, ever asked me about the money I spent. And, 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 and so we have to get out of this mindset that you have to give people again, this huge stack of white ring binders that describes all the processes and all the swim lanes and all the, you know, you only do that to children. Grown-ups, you just, you know, there's a quote from um, General Patton, you know, if you just tell people what you want them to achieve and leave them to it, you'll be amazed at the results or something like that, right? And the, now another one I think we've already mentioned is that managers don't know the answers. Right? Why do we expect the manager to solve the problem? Why do we expect the team to come to the boss and say, hey, boss, here's the situation, what should we do? Why is the manager the one who has to come up with the answer? They just don't know the answers. Just because you've got manager in your title doesn't suddenly make you smarter than the team somehow. Right. So let the people doing the work um, design the work. So this picture was put up as a joke on somewhere, LinkedIn or somewhere um, recently. And it probably is a joke, but I said, but, but it's just possible that he's doing that because you'll get a broken toe. He's learned that you're liable to get a broken toe if you start chopping the coconuts off while you're standing underneath them. Could be, right? So when you look at a way people are working and you go, that's stupid, it's like, well, hang on a minute. Either that's stupid or you're arrogant. Maybe you need to go and talk to them and understand why they're doing it the way they're doing it. Who knows best how to do the work? The people doing the work. So we get to this idea of servant manager. And, and by the way, the buzz phrase you probably all heard is servant leader, but we don't like the term servant leader because we distinguish between managers and leaders. It's them. When you read about servant leader, they're actually talking about servant managers. They talk about changing the way you manage. And, and, and so we talk about servant managers, but the, the generally accepted phrase is servant leader. And, and so the whole idea is, again, you know, flipping the hierarchy. A servant manager exists to serve the people doing the work. They don't serve their manager. They're not the servants of the manager. The people doing the value work are the important people. The manager is there to facilitate and serve the people doing the work. And as soon as I was talking to Cherry this morning about this, another key word, which is not specifically in here anywhere, which is very important for managers, is humility. Right? And along with trust comes humility. Just because you're a manager doesn't make you better than anybody else. Right? And, and in fact, it makes you worse than other people because you're now divorced from the work and probably you're seeing less of it than the people doing the work. And the higher up the hierarchy you go, the further away from the work the people are. And so probably the less equipped they are to have any sort of opinion about how the work should be done. Think about that one. The higher up the hierarchy, the less they know about the work. So humility is a huge part of new ways of managing. Having the humility to not think you're better than everybody else. Having the humility to understand that you don't get to keep secrets just because you're a manager. Having the humility to understand that you should be open to what you're thinking and doing being inspected. And having the humility to realize that other people are actually more important than the managers. Much more important because they're doing the value work. So related to this is go to the Gemba. So Gemba is a, a Toyota a Japanese word, right? Used a lot in lean. Gemba is the place where the value is created. It's the place where the work's happening. It's the coalface, we would say. I like the phrase, I'm not sure if it's mine or I got it somewhere, go from the carpet to the concrete. Right, go from where the floor is a carpet to where the floor is a concrete in a factory context, right? Go and, go and see the work. Be present in the work. So it's not enough just to observe it. Be present in it um, and, and be talking to people. Be understanding the challenges. Be seen to be understanding. Be seen to be present, to be caring. Measure it yourself. We'll come back to this in a minute, right? But 
you know, people doing the work shouldn't be measuring the work. And then I always say to people, you really want your staff to understand that you're at the game, but don't just walk around every morning going, hi, how are we today? How was the rugby? Right? That's not going to the Gemba. Going to the Gemba is understanding, talking to them. And when they tell you that there's an impediment, there's a problem, there's an issue, there's something that could be improved, go, okay, and come back as soon as you can and say, remember that thing you told me about? Look, I've fixed it. Then they'll know you're in the Gemba. So then we get to invitational management. So remember I said, you, you can't make managers do anything. I can't make workers do anything. We can't make managers do anything either because they're knowledge workers as well. Actually, you can't make managers do anything because they're knowledge workers. Everything we say about knowledge workers applies to managers. You can't make managers manage. You can only invite them to manage. Managers are as much a part of the system as they are managing the system. But anyway, you can't make knowledge workers do anything. So you can't see what they're doing. It's in here. You can't just stand by and observe them. You know, there's all those dilbits with the boss watching and going, no, you're pressing the keyboard wrong. You know, you, you, you can't see what they're doing. You can't see their work. You can't count their work. They're not doing transactional work anymore. You can't measure the individual. They work collaboratively as a team. They're bouncing value off each other. You can't tease out which bit of value that person gave. You might have someone on a team who appears to do nothing, but there are people from other teams who are coming to them all the time, asking them for advice and solutions and value. You could have someone who appears to be doing nothing, but they're heavily mentoring four other people on the team. They're the master. The master can look like they're doing nothing. You can have somebody who does apparently no value work at all, but who is the heart, the spirit, of the team, almost the mascot sometimes. I've seen somebody who appeared totally useless get laid off and the rest of the team, their morale just crashed because that was the person that kept everybody happy. What happens if teams don't measure themselves and the management are measuring them? I, I think it comes back to trust and collaboration that what I'm saying is that if you're busy doing value work, you shouldn't be wasting your time doing data collection. And so if there's a trust relationship then you trust the management to do the measurement. And that's just taking one load off the people who now don't have to capture all that data. If every time you have to keep stopping and filling in a spreadsheet about what you just did, that's an overhead. Um, so you, yeah, you can't measure the individual and you can't make people do good work. So this is deeply challenging to conventional scientific management. All you can do is invite them create an environment where they want to do the work that you want them to do, that you're all on the same page, you're all heading towards the same goals, the same values. I just adore this quote. This is a, one of my favorite quotes. Um, While losing control is one of the biggest fears of management, having control is one of the biggest illusions. Conventional managers think they're controlling what people are doing. You know and I know, think about it, yet they're not. People are doing what they want to do. People are doing it the way they want to do it. And if some manager is trying to make them do it a different way, they perform theater to create the illusion for that manager that they're doing what the manager wants, just so that they'll bugger off and leave them alone so they can do the work the way they do it. That's the reality. Managers aren't unconventional, don't have the level of control they think they do. So we're not, when we fear losing control, it's like, well, you don't actually have it in the first place. It's a lovely, lovely quote. Lots of management books talk about the generally accepted model for what conventional management looks like is these five functions. Right? This is textbook management 101, that managers perform these five functions. And that's crisp and generally agreed and taught in universities everywhere and blah, blah, blah. blah. When you say, well, okay, what does new ways of managing look like? There isn't a crisp, generally agreed model anywhere. Right, there are models, but there's nothing that has broad agreement in the world. Um, so therefore, we came up with our own model. So the Teal Unicorn speech bubble, this is Teal Unicorn talk, is that we say that we think that these are six of the primary functions that managers perform in new ways of management, right? That um, we're there to attract people, talent, 
and resources together around a piece of work. We're given a goal. Remember I define management as managers are given a goal by the organization that they're set there to use the resources and the people of the organization to deliver. So we need to attract what we need around the thing we're trying to achieve. So that's not just about recruiting people in, that's about bringing together the resources that we need. Um, and then a, a second primary function of new ways of management is to nurture the, the, the team and the work, to create the environment where the team and the work can flourish. The third function, and I've changed the word from the book, if anyone's got the book, I, I now prefer the term liberate. We liberate the people, we liberate the work, yeah. So it says freeing in the book, but we liberate the work and, um, you know, move the system back, create space, empower, all those sort of words to allow the work to happen. We motivate people. We get them wanting to do the work. We get people heading in the direction that the organization wants to go. We get consensus, consent, agreement to do stuff. We get people energized and ah, you know all that provides some leadership and then together with the team we explore the domain we've been given to work in we explore the environment we explore the space we explore the, the goals we've been set and what they mean and we explore the work and then the other function is we're there to observe the work because we're there to think about innovation and come up with ideas so one of the principles that's good managers play golf and what I mean by that is good managers have the time to sit back and think and wonder about innovation and new ways of doing things and new goals. The people in the work are busy, 80, 20 rule, but they're still busy. They have 20% to think about things. But managers should be the ones who have the real leisure to stand back and talk to other managers and talk to the team and talk to all the stakeholders and do the thinking. So we have a bigger observational function as well and all that measurement thing sits in there as well. So this may not be right. I mean, we're still evolving. We're still thinking about this, but, and there isn't a nice generally agreed model, but this is our model for now of what are the activities of new ways of managing. This is maybe for some of you, the guts of the course. And it's, it's described in the book. So if, if with all these things I'm talking about, then if you look at the things that managers do, then they're all impacted by these new ways of thinking. How we do all of these things has to change. So remember way back in day one, I said for the organization to change, the management has to change. Right, in order to work in new ways, we have to manage in new ways. In order to allow the work to change, we have to change the way we do all of these things. That's what the book's about. But for lots of organizations, when I see them failing, we told them to do it differently. They're not doing it differently. What's wrong with them? Can you fix them? And the answer is always, you told them to do it differently, but you did nothing differently. You kept managing in the old way and expecting people to work in a new way. It's so, I reckon, I don't know, 80, 90% of failures to, to work in new ways can be tracked back to that one thing, that management didn't change the way they manage. We'll summarize here. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about some of those specific activities and how they look different in new ways of managing, what the impact is on those. Managers should be command should be gardeners, not commanders. Right. So the function of a manager. So there's a quote from somebody again. Who's someone will help me. It's in the book, which is that when a plant is not flourishing, you don't fix the plant. You fix the garden. Right. If a plant is not flourishing, you change the conditions around the plant. And so the managers exist to ensure that the value workers are flourishing and that the value work is flourishing, that everything's growing and greening and things are buzzing. That's what managers are for. And, and, and the closer you are to the work, the more that's what managers are for. So that's absolutely what line managers are for. 
is to be gardeners, is to create the conditions for the workers to flourish and for the work to flourish. And so we're thinking not about, you know, how do we fix the, the flower? We're thinking about what's the flower need to get its job done? We're servant managers. We're bringing resources. We're creating a nice working environment. We're, you know, so um, we're, we're lifting morale. We're ensuring the well-being of our staff. Where this is this is what a gardener does. Um, a gardener occasionally prunes and pulls weeds out, but you know there are times we have to do that. But but the primary thing a gardener does is is to create the conditions for the plants to grow well, not pull them out. Mum always used to say a, we a weed is just a flower in the wrong place. And that's quite profound for HR, right? So another one of my sayings is if you need to fire somebody, there's a 50-50 chance you need to fire their manager as well. Because if somebody got so bad that you have to fire them, their management have, because I said people, you know, unreasonable systems make unreasonable people. A lot of the time, 50-50, a lot of the time someone gets to, to a point where you have to fire them because the system has made them into a dysfunctional person. Their manager has pushed them into a position to make them dysfunctional. So very often the need to fire someone reflects on the management as much as it does on the individual. And, and so to the weed versus plant thing, if somebody's not flourishing, find a different place for them to grow where they do flourish. If they're not good in that role, stop trying to force them it's the square peg into the round hole. Find somewhere where there are a value. So one of the big changes to recruiting in new ways of working is stop coming up with a hole in your organization and going and looking for someone to fit the hole because the chances that you'll find the best person for that hole at this moment in time are quite low. People come and go, they flow through the thing. The chance that you jump onto eBay and find exactly what you want to buy right now is quite low. You need to be watching eBay all the time, waiting for something to come up that is what you want to buy. And so in the same way, when you're recruiting, you should just be recruiting good people and then finding somewhere in the organization for them to flourish. Not having a hole in the organization and then trying to find the people to fit it. Right? It's about just bringing good people in and then organizing them around the work. And so if someone's not flourishing in this spot, there's somewhere else in the organization where they can be providing value. I like to think I was pretty good at that as a manager. And I let people flow to their own strengths. One of the um, uh, First Break All the Rules is another good book by Buckingham. In fact, I think I wished, I so wished that I'd had that book when I was a manager. I think every manager should read First Break All the Rules. And, and one of the many things that Buckingham taught me was stop working on people's weaknesses. Right? If somebody's weak at something, don't keep telling them they're weak at it and they've got to focus on getting stronger at that and learning more about it. Focus on their strengths. Hey, you're really good at this. Do more of that. You know, focus on people's strengths. No, we're not standardized units of machinery, right? The fact that we've got a hole somewhere that we're not good at doesn't mean you try and standardize us to look like everybody else, right? The fact that we're missing that bit is our humanity. That's what, that what makes us unique, is that we're weak at this particular thing, but we're strong at this thing. So build the strength. Stop trying to standardize everybody to the same shape. Some specific profile of skills that you think everybody has to have. There was, I, just, I saw it the other day, there was a company, they celebrate every person who leaves. They, they have a big celebration party because they're leaving, you know, yeah. and it, they've, they've advanced. Good on you. Yeah, let's celebrate the fact that Freddie has advanced. Yeah, and we hope you come back one day, right? You'll be welcome yeah. back. We'd love for you to come back to our organization one day. Absolutely. And, you know, there's that famous quote, you know, what if we train them and they all leave? Well, what if we don't train them and they stay? 